This is for the ethics review class at Parker University. The ninth rule is the advertising regulations. The advertising regulations all generally start with the same general premise. They prohibit false, misleading, and deceptive advertisements. But as the rules develop, generally the regulators, the board members, and the legislators see different types of advertising that they find offensive or misleading and then adopt specific rules to prohibit that type of advertising. So for example, some states expect chiropractors to identify themselves as chiropractic physicians. And there are some billing situations where it's necessary for chiropractors to identify themselves as chiropractic physicians. But Texas legislature made the decision that it might be misleading to the public for chiropractors to use the term physician. So they specifically barred and prohibited chiropractors from identifying themselves as physicians or as chiropractic physicians. Because the rules vary so much from state to state, anywhere you happen to be practicing, you need to be sure you understand the rules that you are or licensed under and make sure your advertising complies with those rules. From the board's perspective, these tend to be easy cases to prosecute. The advertisements usually in writing or published, so it's out there. There's no real question about what the advertisement says. The only question is whether it complies with the rules. And if it doesn't, that's going to be a problem. So in Texas, we start with the board's regulation, which prohibits public communications, which contain a false, fraudulent, misleading, deceptive, or unfair statement or claim, or which has the tendency or capacity to mislead or deceive the general public. One thing to note about this rule is they've used the term public communication, not advertisement. I think that's an indication that the board has a very broad opinion of what this rule applies to. It's not limited to traditional forms of advertising. It certainly includes web pages, letterhead, business cards, as well as some of the traditional types of advertising like radio, TV, uh, newspapers, and magazines. Any statement to the public, to the general public, can be subjected to these rules under the state board. The Texas Occupations Code has a section that regulates advertising by all healthcare professionals. This code starts out by saying that these professionals may not use advertising that is false, misleading, deceptive, or not readily subject to verification. Even though it could be true, if it's not readily subject to verification, it's not a statement that should be used in advertising. The statute then goes on to explain what types of advertising are included. Uh, obviously, an advertisement that makes a material misrepresentation or omits a fact necessary to make the statement not misleading is uh, prohibited. A statement that takes advantage of the fears or emotions of a particularly susceptible type of patient is prohibited. That is certainly a very subjective judgment. And generally the place where I have seen that become an issue has to do with advertisements for personal injury cases. Advertising to people who've been recently injured in a car wreck or on the job must be done very tactfully and should not be done in a way that takes advantage of that patient's particular fears or emotions. So one example of advertising to think about and how to keep it truthful is advertising that you're board certified. Texas regulation requires that when you use the term board certified, the doctor of chiropractic must identify the board that provided those credentials. So what about advertising that a chiropractor is board certified by the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners? The doctor had to pass the national board exams, or at least parts of the national board exams, to receive a license to practice chiropractic. 
So does that mean that they are board certified by the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners? That statement in and of itself may be true, but look back to the general rule again. It's not just statements that are false, but it's also statements that have the tendency or capacity to mislead or deceive the general public. This would be a good example. Not everyone knows that every chiropractor is board certified by the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners. By advertising that you have that board certification, the chiropractor is creating an impression to the public that they have some kind of certification or training above and beyond other chiropractors, which simply is not true. Another example of advertising that is problematic is advertising that you are board certified by the Texas Board of Chiropractic Examiners. This one's actually pretty simple because that statement is not true. The Texas Board of Chiropractic Examiners does not issue board certifications. They issue licenses to practice chiropractic. No one is board certified by the Texas Board of Chiropractic Examiners. Advertising that you are is a false statement and likely to get you disciplined by the Texas Board. Another area where advertising can be misleading is the way the doctor identifies themselves. If a doctor just uses the term doctor to identify themselves, members of the public generally assume that that means the doctor is a medical doctor, an MD. To avoid that misleading perception, the Texas regulations require that chiropractors identify themselves as doctors of chiropractic, DCs, chiropractors, or chiropractic. The Texas statute, which applies to healthcare professionals, prohibits advertising that causes confusion about a professional's credentials or using a professional title or identification that's commonly used by another profession. So using doctor can cause some confusion. The Texas Occupation Code also includes a section or a chapter called the Healing Arts Identification Act. And what this section does is it walks through all the different healthcare professions and spells out exactly how they can identify how they're required to identify themselves. So for example, chiropractors must use the term chiropractor, Dr. DC, Doctor of Chiropractic, or DC in connection with their name. They can't just use the title doctor. And then for other people who might be doctors, like people who hold PhDs outside of the healthcare profession, the statute goes on to indicate how they need to identify themselves and how they need to designate the authority under which they have the title or the honorary degree. Advertising must be limited to the scope of the practice of chiropractic. Sometimes doctors get carried away when they're describing the services that, provide, that they provide. Sometimes they've copied a list of services from somebody who practices in another state. And if they're advertising in a way that's inconsistent with the scope of chiropractic or advertising things that are outside the scope of chiropractic, they're subject, subjected, they can be subjected to discipline by the Texas Board of Chiropractic Examiners. Now, I think the board has noted that there is a lot of advertisements that advertise services outside the scope of chiropractic, especially on the web pages. I think they are looking for that, and I think when they find it, they are seeking disciplinary action or at least investigating those doctors. Advertising by healthcare professionals should not uh, guarantee anything. Uh, the Texas Board rules are very clear. The uh, uh, chiropractors cannot advertise that they provide a cure for any condition. They cannot advertise that chiropractic services are guaranteed. And it just makes sense in the healthcare professions because it's 
varies so much from doctor to doctor and from patient to patient, the results vary so much that it's not appropriate to make a, a guarantee or to promise or imply that a cure will occur. Advertisements also need to be careful about not creating unreasonable expectations. Uh, regulation prohibits advertising that creates a false expectation of favorable results or false expectation of the cost. Besides being prohibited, I think it's also just a bad practice. If, if patients are disappointed by the results that they receive or don't feel like they received everything they expected to receive, they're not likely to come back and they're not likely to make referrals. On the other hand, if you under-promise and over-deliver, the patients are more likely to send lots of new patients and to return to your practice. The rule also prohibits claims that chiropractic services offer results that are not within the realm of scientific proof. As you construct your advertisements, be very careful about how you characterize the results and be careful that those results are something that you can substantiate. The Texas Occupations Code creates a similar provision uh, that prohibits advertising by any healthcare professional, not just chiropractors, any healthcare professional, that creates an unjustified expectation about the results. The next type of advertising I want to talk about briefly is testimonials. The uh, rules on testimonials can be somewhat confusing. On one hand, I think testimonials are probably one of the most effective ways to advertise, but I also think testimonials have been subject to a lot of abuses in the past and have been used in misleading ways. As a result, I think some regulators have a negative opinion about testimonials and will be particularly skeptical or will scrutinize those types of advertisements more carefully. So let's start with the Texas Occupations Code. When the Texas legislature was explaining what is included within false, misleading, or deceptive advertising, they said it includes any advertising that contains a testimonial. When the legislature was asked the question, they essentially made the decision that no advertisements should include a testimonial, no advertisements for healthcare professionals. Now, if you've seen any advertisements for eye doctors or, or diet surgery, you probably know that testimonials are allowed. And what happened is the regulators asked the attorney general whether an absolute ban of testimonials was a violation of the First Amendment. And essentially what the Attorney General came back with was that the legislature or that the state is allowed to prohibit false, misleading, and deceptive advertising, but prohibiting all testimonials would be a violation of free speech. Testimonials that are false, misleading, or deceptive can be prohibited, but that's all. And the rule, the statute as constructed, is overly broad and unenforceable. So as a result, it's pretty clear that testimonials are allowed, even though that statute continues to be on the books. The Texas Board has adopted a regulation to permit the use of, test of testimonials. It does require that the doctor maintain a signed statement from the patient providing the testimonial and to keep it for at least two years after the publication of the testimonial. That means it's important for the doctor to keep track of when they have published testimonials. Um, my particular concern here is not so much printed advertising as web advertising. Sometimes the, uh, even though a web page has been changed or you think you've taken it down, there may be copies or archived copies out there that continue to be published long after you think it has been changed. And I think it's important that you keep those signed statements for a sufficient period of time that if there's ever a question about the testimonial, you can show you had the person's permission to use that, that statement in a public communication. 
In addition to the Texas rules, the FTC has also adopted some pretty extensive guidelines for using testimonials. Now I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. The information is there in the uh, uh, PowerPoints. Uh, besides being in the PowerPoints, if you need more information about the guidelines, you can pretty easily find the FTC guidelines on testimonials uh, on the FTC's webpage uh, and, and go through the rules or the guidelines with more, speci uh, more specificity. Uh, generally, the endorsements must reflect the honest opinions of the endorser. They cannot be deceptive. They cannot be presented out of context. If the endorser is an expert or a celebrity, uh, that endorsement can be used only as long as that expert or celebrity continues to endorse those views. So potentially if somebody endorsed or approved a particular uh, doctor a number of years ago, uh, the doctor may need to renew or confirm that they continue to hold that opinion. If the advertisement represents that the endorser uses the endorsed product, they must be a bona fide user of the product at the time the endorsement was given. So if a, particularly if a celebrity or an expert is indicating that they have used a particular chiropractor, they must in fact be patients of that chiropractor. Um, if the endorsement includes any false or unsubstantiated statements, the doctor is liable for those statements. If there's any material connection between the advertiser and the person providing the testimonial, the endorser, that needs to be disclosed. So for example, if the advertiser is paying a fee to the endorser, that connection should be part of the advertisement so that the public can understand exactly why that celebrity may be making the endorsement. Uh, consumer endorsements, uh, just endorsements by ordinary uh, patients, which is typically what chiropractors use, must rely upon adequate substantiation to support their claims uh, in the same manner the advertiser would be required to do if they had made the representation directly. Sometimes patients get overly excited they really like their chiropractor and they want to help their chiropractor out. So they exaggerate the results that they received or they exaggerate the skill of the chiropractor. And if they do that, you cannot use that testimonial. You must use testimonials that you can substantiate. And by the way, the endorsements themselves are not reliable scientific evidence to substantiate that claim. Uh, consumer endorsements must be made by actual consumers and must be representative of the typical experience. So again, if the patient, the, the endorser has exaggerated what the chiropractor can do or what happens in the chiropractor's office, that can cause problems. Endorsements can also be made by experts. When that happens, the endorser's qualifications must not be misconstrued. The expert must conduct some type of or have the expertise to evaluate that particular product and must conduct some kind of examination or testing. Now, statements about superiority in the context of chiropractic are generally inappropriate. Um, one chiropractor compared to another chiropractor simply is not besides being a very unprofessional way to advertise, I think that's the type of advertising statement that the boards are likely to uh, uh, investigate and, and discipline because those statements cannot be supported. It's just too subjective. If an endorsement is being made by an organization like a chiropractic association, the organization's endorsement should be based on a process to show that the endorsement fairly reflects the judgment, collective judgment of the organization. In other words, it's not something that's simply purchased. It's something that's been, uh, uh, reflects the opinion of the uh, uh, organization as a whole. 
Uh, and lastly, I want to emphasize again, if there's a material connection between the advertiser and the endorser that might materially affect the weight or credibility of the endorsement, then that disclosure, that connection needs to be part or needs to be disclosed as part of the advertisement. So what about public statements by third parties? You know, the internet has created a lot of wonderful opportunities. One of the things that happens on the internet is your patients have the ability to get on the internet and publish comments about your practice. They can make comments on Facebook, on Yelp, on all kinds of other review sites, on blogs, on their own website, etc. So first let's think about comments on your own website. If you allow comments to be entered on your website, I strongly recommend that you reserve the right to approve those comments before they get published. That gives you an opportunity to make sure they're not exaggerations, uh, to make sure that they're appropriate information for you to endorse and put on your website. Uh, blogs, a lot of people have blogs. It's very easy and inexpensive. It is time consuming to write a blog, which is why I don't have one in particular, or not a very active one anyway. Uh, but sometimes blogs uh, include paid endorsements. Sometimes the writer of the blog has received a free sample. And sometimes the writer of the blog will receive commissions when people click over from the blog to order a product or service. If there's that kind of financial connection, that should be disclosed so that the consumer can understand what's going on. Uh, native advertising is an advertisement that appears to be a news article or an opinion piece, but is actually nothing more than a purchased advertisement. Uh, most printed publications have gotten pretty good about identifying uh, items that are paid advertising. It may not be a very obvious identification, but usually it's there. Uh, but sometimes on the web, I see some things that I suspect are really advertising designed to look like some kind of a news piece. And I think that's misleading to the public, and I think that's something that state boards uh, would look at as, as something that would be appropriate for discipline. So what about reviews on Yelp or other websites that exaggerate the benefits of chiropractic or exaggerate the benefits of seeing you, a particular chiropractor. Um, the problem with these websites is they're outside of your control. If it's a good review and it's an accurate review, there's really nothing the doctor needs to do. If it's a misleading review, it exaggerates what the doctor can do. It creates false expectations or unreasonable expectations. The doctor should probably ask the person who posted that comment to take it down. Now, you ought to do it diplomatically because this person is obviously a fan of yours, but ask them because of the advertising rules to take it down. It may also be appropriate to ask the host website, Yelp or whoever, to remove it as well as a misleading statement. If the review includes false statements. Uh, uh, it's just out and out wrong. You know, I saw the chiropractor three times and my cancer went away. That kind of statement is something that definitely needs to be taken care of and removed as quickly as possible. So even though it's outside of your control and you may not be able to uh, forcibly remove it, you should make re take reasonable steps to try to remove it. And that way, if it ever becomes an issue, you can show that it's not something that you endorsed or approved. Uh, fictitious reviews are becoming a problem. Uh, the websites try to develop programs or, or try to uh, design their programs so that fictitious reviews don't occur. And by a fictitious review, I mean the advertiser, the chiropractor in this case, is getting on the website and creating reviews that make it appear as though they were patients and that they uh, uh, had a good experience at the doctor's office. That kind of review is a concern and, and it just flat inappropriate. 
What do you do if a patient says bad things about you on the internet or publishes bad information about you? They indicate you were a terrible doctor, you were unprofessional, etc. I think the instinct of most people is to get defensive and to go on the attack and try to sue the person who put the statement out there. Be very careful about doing that. It doesn't do anything to enhance your public reputation to become known as somebody who filed a lawsuit. And it certainly doesn't help you out to file that lawsuit and then be sanctioned for filing the lawsuit. A number of states, including Texas, have adopted what they call anti-slap statutes. And the general purpose of these statutes is to protect freedom of speech. The concern was that some private companies were being so quick to file libel and defamation cases that they were having a chilling effect on the freedom of speech. And the statutes provide a fairly quick method to dismiss those lawsuits unless the person who filed it can substantiate their claims quickly. And once the case is dismissed, the court is then required to order the doctor who filed the lawsuit to pay the attorney's fees to the patient who made the free speech statement. So be very careful about how you react to bad reviews. Best I can tell, most of the time, the best thing to do when a bad review occurs is to simply ignore it and not to attract any more attention to it. Work with the patients who had a good experience in your clinic, encourage them to post reviews, and they will very quickly outweigh and make that bad review disappear. So what about advertising on Groupon? Uh, Groupon is something where I've, it's a, a new way to advertise and I've not seen a really good clear opinion on whether it's permissible or not. Uh, but I have a number of questions or concerns about Groupon. First question is when is the doctor-patient relationship created? Patient buys the Groupon, the doctor has no idea that the prospective patient purchased the Groupon that gives them the right to a doctor's appointment. Is that when the doctor-patient relationship is created or is it created when the patient actually comes into the doctor's office? Uh, any statements on the Groupon need, need to be carefully worded so that they aren't false, misleading, or deceptive. Uh, need to be very careful about creating a bait and switch situation where the doctor makes it appear that it's less expensive to come into their clinic, even though there's more expensive services that will be uh, applied later. Uh, the, the Groupon needs to clearly identify what services are covered by that coupon or that Groupon purchase, whether additional services might be necessary, and what is the additional charge for those additional services. Can the person who buys the Groupon transfer or resell it? So could a person buy a Groupon for a chiropractic examination for $30 and then resell it to somebody else for $40? And is that a concern? Uh, the fee splitting rules in most states uh, provide that a professional cannot divide profits or share profits with somebody else who's not licensed. So, for example, even in Texas, the other professions other than chiropractic are prohibited from fee splitting. Uh, and lawyers, for example, and lawyers, the, the bar associations, just like the chiropractic associations, I think are struggling with whether the Groupon scheme is an illegal fee splitting scheme. Essentially, the person, the customer, or the patient buys the Groupon. Groupon company receives part of the money and the professional who put the advertisement out there receives part of the money. And that, on its face, is a pretty clear violation of the fee splitting rules. And I think the boards and associations are trying to figure out uh, how to address that. It also could appear to be a kickback. Groupon is receiving a payment for referring a patient. And it's very clearly a payment that they receive 
based on the number of patients who buy the Groupons. Uh, you may also want to think about your contracts with other insurance companies or third-party payers. Some of those agreements to become in-network with an insurance company are pretty extensive agreements, and if you haven't looked at it, it may include some provisions about what fees you can charge to other patients. And if you charge a fee on a Groupon that's less than what you're being paid by the third party payer by the in-network plan, that in-network plan may come to you and say they want to reduce what they're paying you. So be careful about using Groupons. Uh, the other comment I'll make about advertising in general in, in Groupons is anytime you do something that's new are different. You tend to attract the attention of the state board and you tend to attract disciplinary activity. So for example, the State Bar Association. Uh, before 1979, lawyers were not allowed to advertise uh, at all. No advertisement. They could have a yellow page listing with their name, address, and phone number, and that was it. No box around the name, no statements about what kind of practice you had. U.S. Supreme Court made a decision in the Bates case in 1978. Basically, that decision says that free speech uh, prohibits the state from uh, uh, banning commercial communication advertising by lawyers that is truthful. It can prohibit false, misleading, or deceptive advertising, but not truthful advertising. As a result of the Bates case, Lawyers and doctors were allowed to advertise starting in 1979. By the way, that was not the situation with chiropractors. They were allowed to advertise by their rules even before the Bates case. But once that decision occurred in Dallas, if you opened up the yellow pages in 1979, you would find that three law firms had dared to put boxes around their names and then list one or two words or three words to describe the type of cases that they could handle. Perhaps wills and divorces or litigation and employment. Uh, but in 1979 there were only three law firms that even had those boxes around their name in the yellow pages. Each one of those law firms received a disciplinary action letter from the Texas Bar. And the Texas Bar investigated the statements that they made in those limited advertisements to try to determine whether they were truthful or not. By the way, the Texas Bar got into trouble for that. That was not an appropriate use of their authority. But the point of the story is to make you understand that any time you do something new and different, like a Groupon, you need to anticipate that you're going to be scrutinized by the licensing authorities and you need to be ready to respond to the objections that they may have. Advertising, we, we talked earlier in insurance fraud, we talked about waiving deductibles or co-payments and how that is unlawful. Advertising that you will waive co-payments or deductibles is also unlawful. Advertising free services is not prohibited. In my opinion, it is a poor practice. It is not an effective way to recruit the kinds of patients that you want to bring into your practice. But if you do advertise free services, the rules do spell out some additional information that you must provide. If you advertise a free service, you must clearly spell out the services that are free. You must clearly spell out other services that might be provided and what is the charge for those services. And you must identify what the usual charge is for the free service. And if there's a report of findings as, as part of the evaluation, there must be an indication whether there's an extra charge for the report of findings. So think carefully about advertising free services. Make sure your advertisements are clear. Uh, so that they don't create that kind of misleading perception. If your advertisement is based on any type of research, if you, you, you're citing some kind of research study, you must clearly identify the research study and you must make copies available 
uh, to the board or to the public if they ask for copies of it. And that should be fairly simple to do. Uh, I will recommend that if you try to make a statement based on research, that you be careful that you use reliable research. Don't use something that is out of date. Don't use something that has been discredited. And last quick comment about advertising and telemarketing. I think telemarketing is a terrible way to promote any business. I absolutely hate getting calls from telemarketers, and I try to screen and eliminate as many of those calls as I can, and I'm sure you do the same thing. It's just not a very effective way to promote your practice. It does not create a favorable impression about your practice. So I discourage you from doing it at all. If you do choose to use telemarketing, be aware of the Texas Board's rules that apply to telemarketing. Also make sure you comply with all of the FTC's rules about the do not call list, etc., uh, so that you don't get yourself into trouble.